Hi everyone, my name is Charles. I'm really excited to actually kick this off uh, today with the Smart Laboratory of the Future section. Um, so I'm not going to belabor this point because there was a fantastic first presentation, uh, but the 28 billion number, uh, what I want to put in context though is that uh, pharma R&D expenditure in the US is about $50 billion right, a year. So I think that these numbers together really show how much of a, a, an impact we can have in, in solving or at least making a dent in some of the reproducibility issues. Um, so I'm the CEO and founder of BioBright, and at BioBright we're actually building the smart laboratory tools for the future, in particular in pharma. So keep that in mind when I talk, I'm going to talk through that lens as well. Oop, there we go. Um, and I want to share a few paradigms that we've actually deployed and that we've learned from doing these smart laboratory deployments in pharma. The first one of, is, is what I call don't automate augment, and I realize this may be a bit controversial, but uh, the point is that we've done, we've had automation for at least a decade, good automation in pharmaceutical uh, research and in biomedical research in general. What we haven't done really is create a system that is more symbiotic between humans and machines, one that augments human scientific capability. Um, here we go. And the point that I'm trying to make here is that we should optimize for the relative strengths and weaknesses of each one of these systems. So uh, automation is really good at throughput and re reproducibility and repeatability, but there's no um, quality gauge. A robot doesn't know whether what they're doing is correct or not. There's always a scientist guiding that experiment at the end of the day. And on the other hand, humans are really good at intuition and interpretation, but our working memory is relatively small, or maybe I'm only only speaking for myself. Um, and so the point that I want to make here is that there's a, a, a level of human computer interaction that we really need to drive to the next level. We can't achieve another 10x or 100x improvement uh, in reproducibility if we don't tackle the problem of human computer interfaces. And many people in this room are actually uh, tackling this problem. We had conversations even just this morning about this. Uh, but the point is that human computer interfaces are actually changing very rapidly. I don't know how many of you may have an Alexa or a Siri at home, but what used to be computer UI, user interface, graphical, is now morphing into a much more uh, multi-dimensional user experience. And so there is voice now that comes into play. Uh, for the last two years, we've actually been working on a voice assistant that we call Darwin, which is very similar to Alexa or Siri, but the major difference is that it's really tuned for augmenting the scientist in the lab. And so, whereas Siri may, may really be tuned to ordering pizza, uh, ours is really tuned for ordering reagents. Um, and we should have audio on this, by the way. Uh, let me just go back for a sec here. Um, but the point is that Darwin is a key word here. And so, well, I'll just speak it out, but Darwin go to blotting preparation is what's being spoken right now. And then it's Darwin, take a note um, that I order some more natrocellulose transfer packs. The, what I want you to pay attention to is really the vocabulary here, right? Siri would never get nitrocellulose transfer packs um, because it's not really a common consumer word, uh, maybe our kind of consumer. Um, and so again, transblot turbo cassette. So the point is that we've, we've really targeted these custom vocabulary that are very complex to transcribe accurately otherwise. Um, and you can imagine going forward that you can even do much more than just take notes. You can drive robots with this. Um, and the robot can then automate the tedious and complex parts of, of driving it such that it just returns a fully baked um, request with, with the protocol already baked in. All you have to do is load it into the, the computer. The second paradigm that I want to share is really this notion of data-driven discovery. And now I know that we've, we've collected more and more data in this field, um, and I think that we're, we're suffering the pains of it. But one of the things that we still have to change is our mentality around biomedical research. This is a kind of meant to be tongue in cheek, but um, this is what pretty much biomedical research looks like today. We generate data, we collect it in lab notebooks. Some of those are electronic these days, but then eventually it makes it into a PowerPoint. We share that information with peers. It makes it into a bigger PowerPoint, into a bigger PowerPoint, bigger PowerPoint, and eventually, if you're lucky and efficient, every six months, uh, there's a decision level that will, will actually occur and you'll decide to steer the company uh, in one direction or another towards one indication or towards another indication. Um, what I would like to share is really kind of a different 
mindset where the scientist and every person uh, at uh, the company has the ability to ask questions directly. Uh, you can get files back, but more importantly, you can also get most active contributors. And this is because biomedical research is fundamentally a mix between quantitative and qualitative data. So don't treat this just like computer science, where everything is pretty much uh, quantitative. Um, it may be better to actually just talk to the best contributor because they have all the intuition of the system. Um, and you can go one step further. This is a demo that we, we did in uh, augmented reality where you can actually just have the data pop up in context right in front of your eyes using an augmented reality display. Um, and we went even one step further, uh, thanks to a contract with DARPA in particular in neuroscience, where we actually integrated multiple uh, electrode signals, multiple uh, data uh, streams into a single visualization. And the point that you should remember here, this is too complex to go into detail, but is that when data visualization is done correctly, data visualization can become data analysis. This is extremely important when we have a large amount of data to whittle down to uh, and to try to reason about as humans. Um, you can imagine, obviously, coffee breaks where you can just walk past the data and now spur conversations. The point here is that the machines are doing the tedious work that machines are good at, and humans are focusing their entire time on actually building intuition and, and, and trying to make decisions of their experiments. Um, this is not just uh, beautiful and pretty and awesome. Uh, we just uh, we actually did improve the precision of a particular workflow, a complex neuroscience workflow, by more than 20 times, and we cut the number of people required in half. The point here is that there are really tangible um, metrics that you can you, you can control with. Um, and this picture is complex, but what I want to say here is that we all play a role in bringing this uh, um, data-centric um, model to life. Uh, everybody, from pharmaceutical companies down to bioequipment equipment manufacturers. Uh, and I'll leave you with this quote, which is that I think that if you are removing the tedious aspects and the burdens uh, from the daily workflow, and you turn that into an opportunity for discovery, I think this is what we should be trying to strive for, something where we are much more symbiotic with machines. So thank you. I'll take any questions. Is it still a proto? Is it still a prototype? No, it is commercially available. We're working with a restricted number of uh, partners, but yeah, it's available. Yeah. Can you describe a couple of the successes you have in the implementation? Sure. Um, so I described some of the early work with uh, DARPA, and we're now uh, working with pharmaceutical companies. Um, I can't give you hard numbers, but roughly there, there was, per, for example, a high throughput uh, workflow where we found about 30 times more errors than they were before. Um, we think, and the operative word is think here, that this is, has really led them to choose the wrong molecules for development. So obviously, you know, kind of, this is, has a big impact in, in, in pharmaceutical workflows. Mm -hmm. Uh, quick question, is there in the future going to be a version for academics or pharmacy is the only focus? I know why you're, why you're starting with that, it makes perfect sense, but academics obviously can benefit just as much. Yeah, um, so we we have uh, collaborations in particular with the Sanger Institute that are going to become public imminently. Um, we do have partnerships with some academic centers. The tricky part is how to really, um, is the money, is where it starts with. So that's why we're starting pharma. Uh, my ideal scenario would be that this would be available almost for free um, for academics. Um, we're trying to figure out how, how to do that. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I might maybe bring this down a little bit. <laughs> um, so I'm Bethan from Bento Bio. And today, I'm not going to be talking about automation. I'm going to be talking about people. Um, and at Bento Bio, what we want to do is to make learning biotechnology hands-on as easy and as simple as possible. Um, so. You have the clicker there. Oh, brilliant. Do I? Yeah. You do now. 
I do now, okay. <laughs> Um, so today we're talking about the future of the laboratory and what I'd like to talk about is who will be in that laboratory of the future. So this little guy, in 10, 20 years, what does the laboratory that he's going to be using look like? Um, and where will that be? Um, so to start off with, I'd like to share an analogy. Um, and so on your left, you've got computers 50 years ago. They were huge, they're expensive, and to use them you often needed a qualification. And on the right, you've got laboratories of today. And you can see where I'm going with this, especially because we've made the photo black and white, but we have some of the same restrictions um, in the laboratory now. Um, and now we've progressed to this point where you can buy a computer like an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi for $30, and what that's meant is that it's also change the types of people who are using computers. Um, so you have maker communities that are using these Raspberry Pis and Arduinos. Um, and this is, and the shift of users is really where I want to draw your focus and attention. Because um, for example, your eight-year-old could program themselves a smartwatch. So at Bento Bio, we're building a portable DNA analysis laboratory. Uh, it contains all the kind of standard bits of kit molecular biologists use on a day-to-day -day basis to do DNA analysis. Um, and, but for us, the focus here was to actually change the design so that it focused on friendliness, on user accessibility. And it was actually something that you could literally carry around in a bag with you. So last year we actually launched this um, on Kickstarter and, and that was really interesting for us as well because it, it was a public platform so it's changed the type of people that we've attracted um, and some of the user stories that come out of that are really interesting. So as you might expect we've got traditional scientists um, but rather than doing the work in the lab they're doing it on top of a New York skyscraper or in a Madagascan jungle. We have people that are doing um, pop-up science education and that goes from New Zealand to a rural community in Haiti. And then more interestingly, we have citizen scientists. People who are doing science outside of an academic institution without support. Um, so this is Jean Paolo and he's doing a project where he looks at um, the genetic ancestry of yeast. Uh, so you, ideally you could say to him, I really like this Red Church IPA. And he'll say to you, cool, this other tiny rebel IPA is genetically similar, so maybe they'll taste the same and you should give this one a go. But Jean Paolo fits into a much larger movement of people that are doing this. It's a global community. So there are people all around the world that are teaching themselves to do biology outside of a lab um, from scratch, they're computer coders, artists, um, and this is a picture of a meetup that I attended, actually taken by David Kong in the room, <laughs> uh, where people were sharing techniques and projects and what they were doing. Um, and last month, David actually hosted um, a global meetup in uh, Boston at the MIT lab. And there were people coming from Burma, from Chile, um, talking about bioprinters, using liquid handling robots. Um, so it's, it's a much larger movement um, and, and it has all these different kinds of names that you might have come across, biohacking, DIY bio, citizen science. So just going back to this guy, um, today we're talking about exponentials. Exponentials in terms of how to make the technology faster, cheaper, more reproducible. At Bento, what we want to focus on is the people. How do you enable bottoms-up innovation? The future of this technology is not just going to be in how it develops, but also in the number of people that are using it. And with a technology as powerful as biotech, we also have a responsibility to um, create better educational resources uh, and ensure that we're innovating responsibly. Um, <laughs> so you might recognize this guy. Um, this is George Church. Um, and he is a supporter of the DIY bio movement. Um, and this, and last month, he actually described um, Bento as an Apple II moment. So it's kind of nice to have reassurance that it's not just us that believes in this future, but also him. Um, 
And just in terms of finishing, my ask for you today is um, if you had access to a lab uh, outside of your own work and you wanted to explore a question and maybe you wanted to do that with your son or your daughter, what type of question would that be? What would, your, what would you use your laboratory for? Um, and how might that look in the next five, 10 years? Cool, thank you. that your, your bento box is basically directed towards? Um, I mean, I guess ideally if you look at the school curriculums, it's sort of 14 plus, but we've worked with uh, kind of like 10 year olds upwards. Um, it depends what the ability of the child is, I guess. Thank you. This is a really cool concept. My question was, do you have tie-ups with the uh, with communities in developing countries, and you did mention it, um, especially the school children for, for doing the, their own science experiments. So what was the first part of that? Do we have... Tie-ups with um, communities in developing countries or yeah, we're schools in developing countries? We're starting that. It's, um, so we have links to um, communities in, well, like I mentioned, Haiti and um, India as well. And then I think how that develops is how well we build relationships and partnerships um, and how much resources we have. Hey, um, over here. Hey. Oh. <laughs> uh, have you thought about working with curriculum publishers um, to you know, bundle your bento bio with it? So can you give me some examples? So McGraw-Hill or like some of the big kind of biology curriculum publishers? Just yeah, that's, um, that's actually something that's come out of, uh, yeah, we might be. Um, it's very recent, um, but a suggestion from someone at, yeah, yes. And then there was a question over here. What would you say to someone who might think democratizing genetic engineering is terrifying? Um, that's a question that we get asked a lot. Uh, and I think that, um, so the rough answer is the more education that people have, the easier it is to recognize something that's terrifying and something that's not. And this type of equipment is already available via eBay. If you want to get your hands on it, you can. Um, so the question is about, I mean, people are rejecting things like GM technology because they're scared of it. And that, I'm, the, the argument doesn't always line up, but I think that part of that fear comes from a lack of um, experience and a lack of getting hands-on. Uh, what we're pushing for is to say, well, let people um, experience this and, and learn about it, and then they can make up their mind. Um, but more education has got to be a good thing. Same with this, uh, sex education, right? <laughs> uh, how much does this cost right now? Um, so it's a thousand pounds, which I'm not sure what the currency rate is at the moment, but that's like thirteen hundred dollars, fourteen hundred dollars. It's going down all the time in terms of U.S. dollars, and <laughs> unfortunately. Just uh, one follow-up: What is the issue with uh, providing reagents? Um, so that's been a really interesting um, work for us: is to look at um, freeze-dried materials um, or alternatives to using restriction enzymes. There are some. There's some really great, I mean, it depends what kind of reagents you're thinking about, but um, so you can have fine polymerase that will last at 37 degrees for a month or enzymes that last up to three months um, at room temperature. But do you work with vendors for simple liquid reagents, for plastics, for pipettes, those sorts of things? Yeah. That come in yes. To provide special packages and yeah, scales? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Cool. I think that's, I'm being cut off, so I'm going to, th thanks very much. Hi, my name is uh, Rachel. I'm from Science Exchange, and uh, it's an outsource marketing or marketplace platform for outsource R&D. If you guys have not heard of Science Exchange before, 
Um, one of the biggest things that we're really trying to do is to enable scientists, whether from pharma scientists, industry scientists, biotech, to academic researchers to really be able to outsource their projects efficiently um, and uh, have access to world-class labs that are able to do their projects as well. So some of the biggest challenges that we've really seen um, in outsourced R&D is that there's just really a lack of knowledge in who is, um, who's the good lab to use out there and which supplier, you know, if you Google it, how do you know that they're actually good or they're just, you know, really advertised based on the keyword search. Um, another thing that we've also seen is that once you do find a lab, uh, do you know if you're able to work with them right away? Do you need to set up a direct contract with them? If you work in an academic facility, who do you work with you know, to make sure that you can actually do the MTAs and MSAs and things like that? Directly contracting can take up to you know, months, um, if not a year, um, to actually set up uh, your project properly to move forward. So what we are, um, we're a platform, an online platform, um, with over 2,500 service providers, CROs, academic cores, um, that are all pre-contracted with Science Exchange. And so if you're a researcher and you uh, sign up um, and you have a contract with us, um, then you're able to work with these service providers uh, quickly and efficiently. Um, another thing that we also do is we handle a lot of the billing and kind of the tedious administrative work um, that you may have uh, when you're trying to work with outsourcing platforms and simplify that process for you as well. And one of the other things that we also uh, have um, is a concierge team. So it's a team of uh, PhD, masters, and industry trained scientists that are available um, free of charge to use to help you find an appropriate lab to outsource your research. Um, we also help with project management support. So, you know, you're working in a lab, you don't want to check um, whether or not your outsourced project is, those milestones are being met. Um, and so we can help handle that for you as well. Um, one of the other things that you know, Science Exchange has been involved in and our concierge team has been involved in is really sourcing and managing the reproducibility project for cancer biology. Um, some of you have probably heard about this before, uh, but it's one of the largest public biomedical replication projects um, that are being undertaken. And so not only are we involved in the Cancer Biology Project, um, but our co-founder, um, Dr. Elizabeth Irons, has been really um, on the forefront of uh, managing and starting a lot of reproducibility projects via Science Exchange as well. Um, so these are just a few um, that we've been involved in, including uh, private validations for pharma companies. Um, so one of the major ones um, that we've been uh, doing is a reproducibility project for cancer biology, which is a collaboration between um, Science Exchange, the Center for Open Science, um, as well as eLife uh, to really uh, um, produce a large replication study taken from 50 high impact um, cancer biology papers and you know, um, conduct them by third party independent labs in our network to ensure that the key figures are um, you know, showing whether or not they're actually re uh, reproducible. And so what we have so far um, is uh, we've been able to complete uh, 11 of these replication studies, and seven of them are already published and available to view on eLife. Um, and at the end of this project, which will be coming up uh, near the end of this year, and so we will be doing a meta-analysis of all of the completed replication studies to really see kind of uh, which steps um, in trying to do a replication study and how the process um, is undertaken. Um, what factors can maybe contribute to a study more likely being able to reproduce. 
And so this is just a snapshot of the types of projects that we have um, in the reproducibility project. You can see that they have a wide variety of techniques um, that, um, that are being tested, as well as a wide variety of cancer types you know, in, the, in this project. And this is just a snapshot of some of the labs that have been involved in the reproducibility project that are also available in, um, on Science Exchange. They range from CROs um, as well as academic cores in the US. And so I saw that I only have about two minutes left to speak, so I'm just going to quickly run through um, just a snapshot of how this is being done um, for a couple of the projects. But essentially what we have is we have the original article that we have um, picked out from, the, uh, from 2011, 2012. Um, and then during that time um, of the project, we wrote a register report um, to really ensure that the protocols were um, peer reviewed before actually starting any experimental work. Once the experimental work was uh, conducted, we wrote up the replication study and that was also published and peer, peer reviewed and published in eLife as well. And um, this is just an example of one where the, there was the replication study that was done was to test the effect of cimetidine um, on human cell lung carcinomas as well as renal cell carcinomas. And they found that the effect of cimetidine was able to actually decrease um, or have an uh, effect um, on the tumor growth. And the replication study was able to show the same, um, same effect as well. I'm just going to skip through this one. Um, but I really wanted to highlight here um, is that a lot of the previous reports about running replication studies showed that it was very um, inefficient and really difficult to, um, you know, to get started and very expensive. And so what we found is that from our published studies so far, that the average time to do these um, was about six to seven months, which included in vivo studies. Um, and the average cost uh, was uh, anywhere between 16,000 to about 15,000 or 50,000 dollars, which is a really low cost compared to what some of the um, some of the studies have shown uh, for to do these projects in house. And so I just wanted to actually, you know, I saw the time that we needed to get to questions and answers. So I'll end on this. This is our platform that you'll be able to access um, through scienceexchange.com. And we do have um, a place where you can easily place your concierge requests, easily search for labs. And then this dashboard is also a way for you to easily kind of track and manage all of your uh, outsource projects. the contractors that you work with? Yeah, so um, that's a really good question. So we are um, ISO 9001 certified and we have um, SOPs that actually um, require a desk audit by our regulatory affairs team to ensure that they meet either the GLP or GMP or any certifications that they say that they have. Um, and they also have a really strict um, application process and so our our team of um, uh, providers, kind of a service provider management team, uh, checks them and runs them against the, any FDA complaints or any other complaints um, in a proprietary software as well. Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a scientist. Mm -hmm. and one thing that comes up a lot clients is why I just call you. How do you guys deal with the... So, so you guys, I think you charge about 10% off the top or something like that, or at least I think that's what my clients pay. And, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of them come to me and say, well, can I just call you? And, yeah. and, and, and you know, uh, I say no. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but but how, do you, how do you deal with stuff like that? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So um, the circumvention kind of, you know, aspect of it. So we actually offer a few um, uh, advantages if you keep everything on platform um, to our service providers as well as to our requesters. So one of the things is similar to Airbnb where, you know, they encourage you to keep everything on platform because if something goes wrong, Airbnb cannot indemnify you. We also 
also have an indemnification clause as well. So if something goes wrong, Science Exchange is there to really help arbitrate any disputes um, and things like that. And we also handle um, the, the payment process. Um, so there is a guarantee of payment um, as long as the work was completed as described uh, in the SOW to the service providers. Um, and we don't charge the requester until after the work has been completed and satisfactory as well. Um, so maybe just a question on the scientific reproducibility, because mm -hmm. um, this is obviously something that uh, uh, could help in terms of, uh, you know, that you would re be required or more likely to be accepted in a journal if you had like an anonymized third-party lab verify yes. that verified your results. So are you aware of any such movements? Are you guys thinking of uh, uh, progressing in that direction? Yeah, so this is actually where we found um, a lot of pharma companies like using us to do these kind of one-off projects to determine whether or not they should even move forward in a particular study. Um, and so that's actually where we've partnered with a lot of pharma companies um, who are now using Science Exchange for their outsourced research. Um, and they, they find that really doing it for these um, uh, reproducibility studies are very valuable, especially since you're able to um, do that by a third party as claimed, you know. Um, I don't want to presume, but I think I know the answer. The question is, for your uh, reproducibility um, initiative, the publications, so you have the protocol published, right, and then the, the full study. So when you review or send it for review in a peer-reviewed journal, eLife, mm -hmm. are the reviewers blinded up? Are you blinded to the reviewers, or you choose the reviewers, or? For the, the reviewers, we do not choose the reviewers. Um, I would have to check, actually, to see you know, the, the blinding of that. Um, yeah, but I can, I can check that and get back to you on that as well. Thanks. So one, one last question. Mm -hmm. uh, early on, for the cancer reproducibility project, mm -hmm. early on, um, for the cancer reproducibility project, Elizabeth Irons, um, w alluded to the fact that it was actually a lot more expensive than originally planned, which to many of us was not necessarily surprising. Mm -hmm. But now the numbers that you're showing actually indicate that it's surprisingly cost effective and efficient. Mm -hmm. So what's yep. changed? Yeah, so I think in terms of the ones that actually, the ones that we've had um, published so far, um, it, it probably is because those ones, we were able to get the information from the original authors a lot quicker. Um, and so again, these were only the statistics from the completed studies so far. It would be good to see the meta-analysis of all of the studies um, to, you know, to get a better estimate at that average cost. Um, okay, uh, quick question. Keep moving. Bye. Done. Can you catch your end of break? Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Douglas Densmore, who could not be with us this morning. So he's uh, helicoptering in remotely. And uh, we want to thank him because he spent a lot of time working on the steering committee for this meeting and uh, helped to really improve it. Okay, I, I apologize that I can't be there. I can hear my voice a lot. Sorry. Um, I apologize, can't be there. This is probably the worst way to give a talk, and I'm really excited about this meeting. I, I do want to thank the organizers. If there are questions, uh, feel free to, there's any number of the ways you can get a hold of me, so please do shoot me an email. I'd love to talk more with folks. I wish I could be there. The other thing I realized is this is probably the worst PowerPoint to walk someone through because there's lots of animations, but I think we'll make it through. So are we seeing the title slide then? Yes. Okay, good. So if you go to the next slide and you animate through about three things, you're going to see uh, what I do. So in my group, just to give some people some context, what I have is I have a research group called the Cross-Disciplinary Integration of Design Automation Research. We make software for synthetic biology. Once that software has matured, it's then turned over to a nonprofit called the Nona Research Foundation, which maintains open source synthetic biology software. Then companies like Lattice and Asimov, two companies which I'm involved in, can then take that software 
and do commercial things with it, as could any other company. So if we animate through this slide a couple times, again, eventually what you'll do is you'll see a list of logos. You'll see things Cello, Merlin, Eugene. These are all software tools that my group makes. The reason I bring them up in this meeting is because all of these software tools rely on automation. All of these software tools at the end of the day are trying to do something either in a more replicable way, scaling up biology, connecting biology with computation, et cetera. So all of these things, all these software artifacts are going to require an automated environment to actually produce what I call wetware. Most of what I talk about in my talks is that we have software. The software ends up using hardware like microfluidics or electronics and ultimately produces wetware. So to do that, we need automation. So if we go to the next slide, the next slide should have the Cello logo at the top with the Biological Design Center and MIT. I just want to give you one example of a software that would need automation. If you step through about three animations, again, maybe four, you get the fact that this is making a genetic compiler. So one of the things my group tries to do is take high-level descriptions of a function. We want to turn function into DNA. So again, software making wetware. And if we go to the next slide, which is slide four, and again, the animation through this is not important. If, if the person controlling just were to step through this, what you'll see sliding through the frame is the fact that high-level descriptions of functionality are turned into circuits, and then those circuits ultimately get mapped to DNA library elements. And kind of the last piece in that animation at the bottom, if that's showing, is that those large sets of circuits, when we make an individual circuit, we end up making lots of variants. So again, back to the theme of this, is that the software making wetware, we don't just make one circuit, we potentially make thousands of circuits, depending on the space of designs that's available. And not only is that going to be hard to manage intellectually uh, without computing, or automation, but it's also going to be impossible to manage the data flow. It's going to be impossible to, to capture the rules and learnings. So all of this will be re uh, required an automated environment. So the next slide, the things, again, that happen if we can step through all of this slide. If it's, what's happening in, in this slide is basically the fact that high-level tools like Cello make design plans and then ultimately, at the end, go to the twist tool called Puppeteer. So I hope you're seeing that. I know there's lots of animations. But the idea being that what I'd like to talk about in this meeting for people to think about in the lab of the future is how we can connect high-level computational designs to their physical realization. And there's people like myself and other people that are thinking about how to do that now. And that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of my talk. So slide six, that has the picture of nature. I don't think I need to talk to this group. We can go to the next slide. We know automated labs are going. So then on slide seven, we're talking about another article, and I just want to point this out. This is the gist of this article is that we're not going to have robotic butlers, so the robot of the future doesn't look like the robot from Rocky IV or something where we actually have people moving, a robot like humans moving things around. It's going to be taking kind of existing style anima uh, automation and, and, and connecting that in intelligent ways, both from a software standpoint as well as their physical realization. So slide eight, I heard the beginning. We can go to both of these. I know we've already talked about the picture on the left. Re uh, reproducible research is key, but then also there's going to be a complexity uh, that's important to handle. Nothing I think is new. So on slide nine, this is might be new to folks. I think Wayman Zhao is speaking later today. He may touch on this. Something that I had talked to him about, he is really he started this idea is the fact that there could be a global biofoundry consortium. So the idea would be people like the Biofab, iBiofab at UIUC, and places like the Damp Lab, which I'm going to talk about at BU, might be placed in the United States along with uh, researchers in Edinburgh, Manchester, and Tianjin where we might make a consortium of academically-based biofoundries. And the idea would be to set up uh, shared knowledge, to set up sharing standards, repositories, round-tripping. Um, basically, not only it'd be important to have an academic 
set of folks thinking about these issues, but not only thinking about them, having the actual laboratory infrastructure that tests these out and to work with industry that does have this often. And so if we go to the next slide, slide 10, this could be a biofabrication leader in that thought space. So the idea is if I want something physical, if we animate through this one at a time, add gene is what we think about for plasmids. We have iGEM. We think about electronic registries. We think of the BioNet that Drew Endy and others at Stanford lead thinking about a, a way to do materials tracking and transfer. And so the Global Biofoundry Consortium could be the standardized manufacturing side of that. So we've got physical, electronic, tracking, and then we have a manufacturing side. So that's something that I'm sure Wayman will be happy to talk about in the breaks. So I'm happy to talk to folks outside this meeting about this Biofoundry Consortium and how we could, we could keep moving with that. Next slide, slide 11. Uh, you can step through that. So one of the things we're doing at BU is making the damp lab. I made a joke that it's not wet, it's not dry, that's why it's damp. It stands for design, automation, manufacturing, and prototyping. And so what we do in that space is we both do the manufacturing of wetware as well as the manufacturing of low-cost, continuous flow, microfluidic devices that are used for synthetic biology. The next slide, 12, just shows that I noticed when I was looking through the International Gene Synthesis Consortium that places like the Edinburgh Genome Foundry were on here. So there was this fact that we had commercial partners, but also academics. So the DAMP Lab, I hope sometime in 2018, will also be a member of this consortium. So if we go to slide 13, where is this located and what's going on at BU? This is a picture of myself, Chris Chen, Mo Khalil, and Wilson Wong. Uh, we've started a new center for and again, I'd love folks to visit. We have other members of this now. Allison Scro, Mary Dunlop, for example, John No, are also part of the Biological Design Center at BU. We go to the next slide, slide 14. You can step through some nice pictures of this. There's about three or four animations that show different pictures. This is a new building built right on the main strip of Boston, right down Commonwealth Avenue. Slide 15. I hope we're going to need to head into Q&A in a minute. Yep. Okay, so we can go to we can go right now. If we just skip to slide 19, apologies, it's very hard to see the audience and it's hard to do with the animation. Mm -hmm. I'll just leave this for this last point. So what I want this community to know is that this Biofoundry Integrated Instrumentation System is coming online at BU. I would love to have a dialogue with folks about how we could connect other software, other hardware, and other infrastructure into this system and make it available to the community. Great. Thank you very much. Actually, that went pretty smoothly, Doug. Good morning. My name is Brian Brough, and I'm going to give you a little preview on how the Department of Energy, of all places, uh, aims to democratize science, especially in the biomedical uh, arena. So I am the deputy director of the Molecular Foundry, which is this lovely building overlooking the bay up here. So take a BART ride, come visit us. So we are one of five uh, nanoscience centers and nanoscience is defined very broadly for its, so it's basically anything small, which, so therefore it's anything biomedical. Uh, we are one of five. Uh, the other four are in other national laboratories in New Mexico, Tennessee, uh, outside Chicago, and outside New York. And we are knowledge-based user facilities. And so I think looking at the other talks that uh, have come before me, we talked about the need to share expertise, the need to share um, software, hardware, all these types of things. We are a knowledge-based user facility, meaning that we invite scientists from around the world to come to Berkeley, come use our facilities, and come interact and collaborate with our scientists. Because we are a multidisciplinary research center where our staff, the, who are world-renowned uh, researchers in their particular fields, spend half their time doing research and half their time lending their expertise to the scientific uh, challenges that users from around the world uh, need their expertise for. So this is, again, the foundry from the uh, other side. There are seven different facilities that we provide free access uh, to. The first three listed on the uh, right side are in the business of synthesis, so making materials. We are a, 
a uh, focus primarily in a, in a material space, but that doesn't uh, exclude really any types of basic science. Um, the one that is probably most interesting to this audience is that fifth floor, the Biological Nanostructures Facility, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, what they do. But when you are trying to make new uh, materials, especially uh, small materials, you need to also have your engineers and physicists that are uh, in the business of understanding, creating computational models to understand how they behave. Fabrication folks who are doing some of that uh, top-down fabrication to make lab-on-chip types of systems, microfluidic systems, and of course, next generation characterization so that you know what you're making. The other benefit of coming to a place like the Molecular Foundry, on top of being free, is that you get to access all the other different facilities at the national labs. A lot of people don't realize that there are 17 national labs that are funded by the Department of Energy, and many of them are creating things that go boom, but a lot of the other ones are in basic science and just basic science. And so you have the molecular foundry, which is listed there. A lot of people go to the advanced light source, which is uh, one of the world's uh, best sources for soft x-ray. A lot of x-ray crystallography is going on there. Uh, the JGI, which was part of uh, the human genome project. So people come, they use the molecular foundry, they make or they look at whatever they're doing, and they can also access uh, some of these other great facilities. So very quickly, um, kind of how do people gain access? There are two calls per year. Uh, they're very short proposals. For those of you who have uh, sent proposals into the NIH, you know, you'll be very happy to know that not only do our proposals only, uh, you know, span two to three pages, but also the success rate is in the 70% range, right? A lot better than the 20 pages and, you know, 10% range for the NIH. This gives you free access for one year, and you can use that year however you like. You can come in for one day, use you know, a really powerful microscope or a robot or whatever, and leave. You can come and make this your home institution for a full year. Uh, as I said, free for non-proprietary research. So this basically means basic science. We have a lot of industrial uh, partners that come in and operate in a pre-competitive model, and so they uh, get free access as well and it's all done through external peer review. So what makes a good proposal? It's basically, you know, that top one. It's scientific impact. There's a lot of other things that we measure as far as, you know, how will the foundry be able to benefit this research? Kind of a fit question, but really it's, what's the most interesting scientific model? And so we talk about democratization of science. It's basically wherever that best, the best idea comes from, we want to make sure that they have the access to the people and the equipment necessary to explore those ideas. So here's a snapshot of kind of who uses us. You can see that's a large number of institutions across the country, across the world. You know, 11% from industry. I think it's up to 12% now. And some pretty impressive folks, uh, you know, National Academies members, Nobel laureates come and use it. But we also have, you know, early stage uh, professors from teaching colleges or small startups as well. Wow, that's a busy slide. This is something that's a, a favorite of our directors, just kind of the shock and awe approach of our science, but really I'd point you to the top left uh, corner, gives you a sense of, our, of how big we are. So we're about a $30 million annual budget that supports something about 45 research staff that are full time here. Um, and supporting, you know, we're coming up on a thousand users a year or so. This is a real uh, quick snapshot of some of the biosciences that we do. Uh, we have combinatorial synthesis for mostly peptides and peptoids. Ron Zuckerman might be a name you're familiar with. He is not only the inventor of the peptide synthesizer, but also the peptoid, the artificial self-assembling um, biomolecule. Um, we do a lot of work with um, biological assemblies that interface with non-biological systems. Um, a lot of bioimaging development. Nanoscience, of course, is uh, quite uh, advantageous in the uh, in creating new bioprobes. And of course, you know, cryo EM, cryotomography, is uh, something that we're very strong in. And so that's. That's it, trying to keep you on time. Thanks so much. Are people able to um, 
Basically, are people able to do sort of fee-for-service work? Are they able to rent space, or is it all through grants? Are small companies able to? They are. Um, a lot of the small businesses would prefer to go the free model, of course. Um, regardless if you're go if you're going to pay for it or not, you still need to be above the bar scientifically. So basically, if you think about this, it's. Uh, if you have a professor that is writing for uh, a proposal for grant money from the NIH, they get money and they do some science, the benefit to the taxpayer, the benefit to the country is the knowledge they produce. And so really the, the purpose of this place is to facilitate great science and produce great science. So it's not so much a, an incubator space if there isn't a strong scientific uh, question that is being answered. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. I, I'll try to be polite, but uh, Go ahead. How, is, uh, how has the political climate treated you in the <laughs> last year? Does, does Rick Perry know you exist in or in Berkeley? <laughs> Rick Perry does know that we exist. Um, basic science, ironically, has always done well, um, regardless of political party. And if you actually chart it, uh, Republicans tend to appreciate basic science more than Democrats, if you, if you look at a, a chart. Um, I think that the big challenge with DOE and politics is in the applied side. Um, so with basic, we're actually doing fine. And you know, if, if the Senate bill goes through, we would actually end up with a 12% increase. So w someone over in DC likes us. <laughs> Thank you.